Sure, yeah. So, you know, I was always that kid that loved the covers, right? Because I'm a visual person and that's where my art background comes in. So I remember buying comics with my best friend. Party people, are we ready? Three, two, one. What's going on, guys? Webster out here, the man, the voice of fragrance. Here with man. Let me tell you, um, he hit me up. So I'm like, what's going on? I love to be on your show. I want to talk to you about my new comic and just you know looking at his work. And I was just so blown away, so impressed. So I'm really happy to talk to Eddie Lima, talking about his new book, End of Zed. Eddie, how are you doing, man? Excellent, Eldon. Thank you for having me on here. Uh, I've been you know listening to you for a while. I love your content, so. I'm really humbled to be here. I appreciate this. Thank you. I appreciate you, man. And again, thank you for listening. We were talking a little before we started recording. So I, I really appreciate that again. Now, one of the things before we get into End of Zed. Sure. A graffiti artist. Yes. So how did you transition from being a graffiti artist into doing comics? Because I, I do see looking at the pages, I definitely see some of that influence there. So how okay. did you transition from one to the other? Yeah. Well, a couple of things, you know, I'm not like, I won't call it, I'm not like really a real deal graffiti artist, right? So when you think of graffiti artists, you probably think of someone on the walls or someone on the train from like back in the 80s. So, so I'm not that, that's for sure. I'm a suburbanite. So living in the suburbs during that time, it was something that I always admired from afar. And I had a step aunt who actually lived in the Bronx. And so I would always come and see the pieces there. So I think that's what a lot of people in the suburbs do. They go into the city and they may take things and bring them back. And I remember actually doing graffiti and drawing in school and everything like that. Again, nothing, no, no vandal stuff here. You know? <laughs> Just stuff, you know, uh, stuff through, you know, through art books and things like that. And so bringing that graffiti sensibility to my artwork, because I was always into art, even as a little kid. Um, I think that's what I brought. That's what graffiti meant to me. Um, Especially when you think about graffiti of the 80s, the pioneers, boy, they, they really did some amazing things with not only colors and shapes, but their themes, you know. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, that's one of the inspirations of the comics. So many inspirations, but that's certainly one of them. I, I, I've always found when it's done well, it's just I'm so amazed at the talent. Like these are literally like these mostly gentlemen, but say these gentlemen make these creative murals lifelike murals just from spray yes. cans and to, to, to have the insight and the technique to do that from i guess uh really an applicator that is just wild when you think about it compared to like a paintbrush sure. like you don't know which direction <laughs> uh like this is an aerosol spray you know aerosol sure. spray it comes out small just spreads out so you really have to know how to control that to really articulate the self on your canvas so it's, i've always found that really amazing and, and i'm looking in, in in just some of the pages from end of uh zed there the color just pops off of the, the page in many respects there's that sort of graffiti sensibility that viewpoint really lend to how you color the pages as well Correct. Well, you know, I, I'm the creator of the comic. I wrote the comic okay. and everything. And and okay. and though I'm an artist, I'm not a sequential artist. And so that's okay. one of the things I'm in awe with these comic book artists. So I knew right away once the story was made that I have to find a professional comic artist and a, a professional colorist, you know, okay. because I, I, I have the tendency, uh, unfortunately, Eldon, to want to do everything on my own, right? I, I understand. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it, but in this case, I knew that, you know, the story needed, you know, a professional treatment. But 
I also knew that I'm not going to stay far away from the creation process. Matter of right. fact, I might be a pain in the neck uh, knowing that these artists are going to have to work with someone who is somewhat controlling, you know. So luckily for me, I found uh, a really great artist as, after vetting some people uh, looking through a list. Uh, I found an artist called Lucas Assis, uh, Assis, and he actually is an artist from Brazil. And that's another thing, too, you know, uh, having artists from, you know, countries, for example, like Brazil, who celebrate colors and everything like that was super important to me because that's very important to the aesthetic of the comic and particularly the theme of the story or, or at least the setting of the story. Uh, the setting is going to take place all in one night. So there's going to be three uh, episodes uh, to this, uh, three okay. issues. And so I knew that it was going to be a night. It's all going to take place within a night. Uh, but with that, the colors better be vibrant and the colors better pop in the night scene. So that's why right. I hired uh, not only Lucas Assis as my main artist, but also a colorist called, uh, I call him G, G Sabino. And he also is from Brazil. Um, and so that's that's what really helped. I, you know, I knew that I had to get artists that were sensible to colors. And I also knew from my graffiti uh, background that color was going to be an important part to the story. So thanks for recognizing that. Hopefully you saw the, how yeah. it pops out of the pages. That's excellent. Yeah, Thank it you. really does. Because even just the, the cover itself, I'm looking at it. I, I love the bluish and the grays really to denote yeah. the, the night and the buildings, the, the silhouette of the rain coming down, the, the bright full moon, and even the little touch of the sneakers um, yeah. over the power line as well. Like it's Correct. just, it, Correct. it really sets the atmosphere for the book without even opening the book so I, I really really enjoyed it like i said it just it pops off of of the page now with that Thank tell you. us about end of zed yeah so gosh you know end of zed is a story about a robot who uh crash lands in the south bronx in 1982 new york city and he has no memory and he's badly damaged and he has to navigate during a time which is probably the most turbulent time in the city's history uh, I say that because on the one hand, you saw the birth of the the negative side of the birth of the crack epidemic, for example. Right. But he also saw the positive sides of the birth of hip hop, which right. introduced a new music it introduced new fashion, you know, uh, and introduced new art. So he has to navigate his world through this. And what he ends up doing, he ends up uncovering not only his origins, uh, but he also uncovers what his ultimate purpose is here on Earth. So it's a lot about programming and him coming with a blank program and how these things shape and mold him into who he uh, needs. We'll put it that way. Okay. Now, how long had this story been sort of gestating in your mind? Uh, say it again. I think you came out a little yeah. bit. Oh, how yeah. long had the story been? How long have you been oh. cooking the story? Oh, excellent. So I, I've been thinking of the story as a kid, basically. You know, every time I would draw something, especially when it came to graffiti, he'd be a character that I would illustrate. Um, and I knew that he had, I knew he had a story behind it. Even on a subconscious level, when I would draw him, I would know, you know, that there, there, there's something more than than just what I'm drawing here. There, there's a there's a reason why I'm drawing this. So I have an Instagram account uh, and it's called a ZNK 238. It actually covers my journey of taking all my graffiti pieces and making them digital. And I remember that, okay, I'm sitting on this character called, at that time he was called ZNK, and I'm gonna create a little mini comic book for myself. So if you head over to ZNK238 uh, on, on Instagram, you'll actually see that journey and you'll see that comic of the first iteration of the story. So yes, he's been in my mind for a very long time. And then, uh, you know, I do something interesting, Eldon. Uh, what I do is every, every every year I start a project in the beginning of the year that I dedicate myself to, and I will dedicate the whole year to it. And at the end of the at, at the end of the year, I'll, I'll I have a certain metric I want to reach. You know, for example, on that graffiti site, um, I I remember I've never really had a, a social media presence. So in that January, so I'm going to create this graffiti site, and by the end of December, my goal is to have a thousand followers. Let's say. And so that's what I dedicate my whole, you know, off time, obviously, to to get to get to my end goal. And in this case, with this story, uh, I started two years ago and I said, I want to write a screenplay about this because originally it was going to be like a movie I had in my head. So in the beginning of the year, I created a screenplay and I knew nothing about writing a screenplay. So I learned everything on YouTube. I read a lot of books. Uh, one of my favorite books was called uh, Save the Cat, for example. It teaches you about, you know, story arts and, you know, studied this, you know, the three act structure and everything. 
And so at the end of the first year, it was written. And then this year, you know, I had to find a vehicle of how I'm going to tell the story. And I said, it really does lend well to a comic book format. And the whole year I started doing the comic book. And, and here we are where uh, um, the comic book will go into Kickstarter uh, next month. And the preview page hopefully will come by this weekend. And we're going to see. We'll see what the audience thinks. Um, and as you saw from my website, I, I give uh, the first five pages away for free so you can kind of see it. And the um, the impact I'm getting from it, the feedback is really, really positive. Uh, it's something that some people have never seen before, especially if you read the first five pages, it kind of shows it's a different tempo than your regular comic book. Yeah, I, I, that is something I get as well. And I think that the, the tiny robot sort of genre is not necessarily brand new, but I right. always find it interesting how creators are able to make something an idea that is like it's really so ubiquitous in pop culture you know we had right. or even just you know your game and what the uh, astrobot just came out on playstation 5 so right. they had that whole thing right. um wally uh eva you know this you know recent pop culture you know they're, they're, the robots have always been you know even us growing up like tiny sure. robot toys and, and whatnot like it's always been part of our culture but i find it interesting how creators are able to find new ways to really express the genre. And just even looking at this, it is like the pages, like it's action packed pretty much from the jump, from the crash landing to running through the alley to encountering the dogs. You know, this is just, you also get a sense of, of fear as well yes. from him, you know, yes. crash landing, not knowing where he is, in the corner right. and then by the end you get to that that final page he's just kind of like up against the dumpster hiding right. you know <laughs> and it's you, you get that sense of emotion and i think that one it takes really good writing but really good art really to convey that sort of emotion of pretty much a non-human character you know Correct. where you don't have any sort of facial expressions to really go with and it, it you know you guys do a really great job just you know, emoting that from the character in these preview pages. Sure, absolutely. And and, and being scared was so important in the beginning, right? I, I think that's one of the fascinations we have about robots is that, you know, as as, a, as emotional beings, right, we like to think that everything's emotional. So when you have something like an entity like a robot that doesn't have emotions in some cases, it's kind of perplexing because we can't relate to things that don't have emotions. And so when they start giving off, when you think of like R2-D2 and C-3P of Star Wars, when you start seeing their personalities, that's something that we can relate to. So in the, in the case of Zed, he lands here badly damaged and with no memory. And I wanted to create a sense of him being scared. So the reader right from jump knows that, you know, gosh, what, what is it like to be in this environment? He has no idea why he's here. He's badly damaged. And he starts to interact with what the city is bringing him. And this is where his blank programming comes in, because now he's got blank programming. So what's he feeding into his head now with all these things about the negative right. things that he sees? And you're going to see later on the positive things that he sees, you know? It's very interesting. Really, one of the main themes is about programming. So, and I appreciate okay. you can see that through a robot's eyes, you know? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, so the, the art and, again, before that, the writing, because the artist takes a lot of direction from the writer and what the writer puts on their page. So definitely, right. I definitely see it. So let me ask you this. So is, wait, is this your first comic that you produce? Yes. First comic, first comic ever. So even even there, I had to go to school with that, right? How do you create a comic? How do you find an artist? You know, how do I change my screenplay into a comic script so it's completely different? And thankfully for me, I, I tell you, Eldon, th thankfully for me, um, I really got into the indie comic culture and other mm -hmm. podcasters and other people that are doing it. And it really is one of the most loving, <laughs> lack of a better word, agree. communities that, that I've ever been involved in. And it's interesting because I think it comes down to everyone's got a story to tell. And you have these these groups of indie creators that, that have the ability to tell their story. So as such, right. not only are they grateful for it, but they're willing to help other people do it. So I am very you know blown away by the community. And it's something certainly that I'll never leave because I met some really important people, uh, people that I will have relationships with for the rest of my life. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree, just even though I'm sort of the outside looking in, just a lot of people I've, I've talked to um, in the indie comic scene, there is no shortage of wanting to help one another succeed um, That's it. in that regard. 
And sure. I, I really enjoy that, that as well as um, just even some of the indie novelists I've talked to over the past few months as well, the same sort of sense of that into independent community, they're always trying to help each other and supporting each other. And I, I really enjoy that regardless of genre, regardless of, you know, how much experience they have, like, oh, you got a book. Okay, here, this is what you need to do. This is what you can talk to. Correct. Oh, you know what? Let me support your Kickstarter. And I, I see this Correct. especially with some of the yes. some of the creators I've met and befriended over the years and their Kickstarters and seeing how everybody supports everybody's Kickstarter. Because, you know, sure. you follow people who's like, oh, so-and-so supported that Kickstarter. So-and-so right. supported that Kickstarter. And yeah. I, I really enjoy that aspect of things. It's interesting. I, I remember one uh, creator, I think it's uh, J.D. Rosario. He said, said it so perfectly. It's like we're taking the same dollar and we're just exchanging hands with it. OK, I'll support you. Here's your exactly. dollar. I'll support you. Here's your dollar. Uh, I believe it was him that said it, which I think is so profound because that, that is the case. But I've been trying to think about why, you know, what, what is it about the indie community that is doing that? What, what is the environment that it creates that has it? Because living in this competitive world, right, especially in our country, you know, it's kind of hard to find that. So the only thing I could think of is what I, what I said earlier, which is I think we're all grateful for that we have the ability to tell the story. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Because I think that as artists, it is it is hard. It has been hard to really tell your story outside of, a mainstream sort of, you know, deep pockets, big corporation who owns what you create after you right. finish. Um, I would say not that independent comics hadn't existed before, right. but I would definitely say the formation of image changed a lot of, of what indie comics could do just from a total business perspective. But then mm -hmm. as we have now gotten, you know, direct to publishing, Kickstarter, you know, Amazon, there are so many different avenues. And, and even, you know, we talked about earlier, just the interconnectivity of it all. You can find artists on Fiverr or on Kiel or the, you know, you know, yeah. start networking people um, to get your comic created. Correct. And there's so many avenues that you can go through where you don't have to use these big corporations uh that will own your properties to get it done so now since right. it's shifted i think indie creators also know that as more money out there there's enough money for everybody so to speak and that's a good point even, yeah even if people's ideas are similar they're still different enough to where you can still cater to the same audience so i think to some degree there is probably even less of a competition compared Excellent. to yeah. other fields because there's a lot of overlap because think about it this way. Like even like back in the day reading comics, like my like I read like Spawn, Spider-Man, X-Men, you know, those are all like right. superhero comics. Sure. They're the same, but still different at the same Correct. time. Correct. Um, and indie yep. comics, I think it just makes it uh even worse. Not so much from a it's horrible, but it's worse than that there. There's so many different flavors of the same Correct. idea because now you have so many different ideas and authors that now have an opportunity to tell a new story. Correct. Correct. Excellent. That's a great point. Yep. And they're certainly taking advantage of it because there's some great stories coming out of the indie scene. Um, a, a lot of artists that I admire, a lot of creators that I admire, they're really taking out uh, great content. Um, there's a, a there's a, a creator called uh, George Medina, and he took out a, a book called Russ. Uh, 5377 and mm -hmm. the story is just so deep and so rich in content um and again it's not what i see on the outside so i think that's what the indie scene's about right it's right. about new ideas new ways of executing the idea and telling the story and of course we benefit from that because we're not you know everything is so homogenized outside of uh, uh, entertainment in general we've seen that story we've seen the way it's been applied in terms of how they applied their art to it but in this case it's great it's always a new story even though it's it's it's, it's everything's derivative right i mean right even music i think comes down to the, like the same five or six chords right, right, right <laughs> you just exactly. mix them in right and so the same but they do it in such a way and i think that's where the passion comes through um that you could really uh you could really dig the stories and, and i certainly benefit from from being close to this group yeah, and I think even with that, the readers are, dare I say, a bit more sophisticated than what people think mm -hmm. comic readers are in general. Because um, I know even for me, there is a um, company, Red Style on Media, who I ended up, um, was on an interview on a long time ago before I started doing this. Um, like, 
I don't know, 2011, 2012 talk to her with a friend of mine and what he was doing and got to meet her at, at uh, Philly. It was, it was when it was Wizard World, so it's like 2012, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. And just from there, like she had, her and her company had this book out called Azteca, loved it. And I've supported them and they're, they're local. Like I'm from Baltimore originally. She's based in Baltimore. So just, okay. she's, she's good people. But I say that to say, going from Azteca with was like bloody and violent to some of the other anthologies to the newest book I've been buying over the past couple of years, Crossing, which is like a murder mystery set in Baltimore. And this uh, wow. girl cool. was killed by a train. So she's now, she's now haunting the train conductor. So then it's like a support for other ghosts. And then there's this mystery that like, it was just so enthralling. Like, <laughs> that's crazy. That's not something yeah. I'm getting from Marvel or DC Correct. In, in many respects. So yes. it's, it's such a artist and creator, let's say creators in general are able to tell so many different stories yeah. um, Correct. through indie comics where they didn't have an avenue before. And that's, I think that's again, another reason why it's just so supportive because there's so many different stories out there to tell and as consumers, there's so many different new things for us to really just sink our teeth into when it comes to indie comics. So, so what happens with the indie comic scene now, though, right? Because as, as you probably know through history, right, um, you'll have something that's pretty, you know, general, like general comic stories by the big three, right? They take out the stories. But if they start recognizing indie stories, do any of them start either directly taking these indie artists and making them professional? Or are they basically stealing some of their stories and maybe embellishing it in a different way? Like, I wonder what happens in that case, because I do think the momentum starts to build where indie comics will, will at, at one point, you're not going to be able to ignore them. So I wonder what right. happens in that case, you know? I, I wonder if there are any sort of metrics, because I think uh, maybe a year or two ago, they talked about how uh, manga outsells American right. comic books and comic book stores. But I don't think that takes into account like all of the books that are published and funded through Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Correct. And yeah, I don't think so. Either, yeah. You know, that are sold. They, I, it's it's really just the big three. And it's weird to even say image of the big three, but, but it is. <laughs> you know, yeah, we are, right, we're a yeah. long way away from what, 1992 when sure, they started. Sure, right. That's true. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I don't think there are any. I wouldn't think there's any real way to quantify that as a like how many issues are sold. You can maybe definitely right. see, you know, how many books are actually um, backed on Kickstarter and some of the other ones, um, Zoop and I think some some other ones. How many indies are actually sold on Amazon? But there is a uh, nobody's aggregating all that data together. I think with the other ones, they just took like what Diamond the in the other major yeah. uh distributor for comics yeah. in the country yeah so yeah. um yeah. but i'm pretty sure it's a a pretty i would bet that it's a larger chunk than many people would i think. agree i agree i agree so very interesting yeah. i agree so so with that what were some of your or were you in the comics growing up and if so what are some of your inspirations for getting into comics sure yeah so you know, I was always that kid that loved the covers, right? Because I'm a visual person and that's where my art background comes in. So I remember buying comics with my best friend at that time and really just buying them solely for the covers, you know, <laughs> and not even reading them because they were that amazing. But there was one comic, I don't know if you remember, it's called Rom. It was about, yes. a, it was about a, yeah, a yeah. robot, of course, it has to deal with robots, right? And I remember finally reading the story. I said, okay, wait a minute. These things got good stories. Too, right. you know? And uh, so that was probably one of the first uh, impacts I had uh, with, um, with, with, with comics, definitely through the story of Rom. Uh, and then, of course, as time went on, you know, the Batmans and uh, mm -hmm. Batman in particular. And especially I love the way they treated Batman from the comics into when they started making the movies. You had the different iterations of Batman, right? You had the Jack Nicholson, right. uh, the, the Michael Keaton Batmans, and then... I uh, had all these iterations, but by, by, by all time favorite, though, certainly the Christopher Nolan Batmans, where, mm -hmm. um, again, it, it was exactly how I remember reading the comic, how it should be like in terms of how dark it is and everything. So so I would say, yeah, yeah the comics, uh, especially that movie had a really big influence in terms of how really comics should be seen. Yeah. I think for me, I've I've grown into loving and appreciating the different iterations. I think when I was younger, like I not to say I wanted to see everything comic accurate, but I didn't appreciate deviations. Well, a lot oh. of times deviations mm -hmm. were 
absolutely stupid and still <laughs> are in some respects. Like uh-huh. you want to have creative license. Well, it's not broken. There's no need to fix right, right, it. Right. <laughs> but with something like a Batman, I, I definitely have appreciated the different versions we've gotten just even over yeah. the past 20 years with the different cartoons and whatnot. It's right. Batman, but it's still something different. I've really appreciated right. that. Even with um, say Spider Man, while I'm not a big fan of the Andrew Garfield second the first film, right. I do appreciate the differences in how they try to create something new with sort of the mythos we already knew and understood. So right. I definitely uh, have a better appreciation for the creative process and for trying to make something that is that holds to the original concept but is still derivative enough where it brings something new and fresh and that that can't be an easy thing to do especially when properties are like 60 years old so i I applaud all those creators in that regard that's a good point yeah i love that too right think about adam west batman and think about christopher nolan and you see the gap in between and oh my gosh yeah it went far yeah it went far exactly yeah i think the chris Chris nolan i definitely agree dark knight the the dark the the whole trilogy but you know, it's something about the Dark Knight Returns uh, or the Dark Knight, excuse me. It's just, that is a masterpiece. And there's no way yeah. of going, yeah. of, of getting around that when you think of just, not just comic movies, oh and, gosh, movies yeah. in general, from from the pacing to the acting. I'm all about pacing in movies. Okay. Pacing mm-hmm. and um, really cinematography, how things are shot, angles and whatnot. And the pacing of that movie is just absolutely perfect. Yeah, There's so point, many yeah. movies I go into nowadays and I say, like Deadpool Wolverine, while I absolutely right, had right. a great time in the movie, I'm like, it could have cut out 15 minutes. You know, okay. it just, like, you know, so many <laughs> things, but like, oh, right. you know, but Dark Knight is like, no, perfect. Like you, yeah, you don't yeah. need to change a thing. Like yeah. everything worked in yeah. that regard. And I yeah. think that movies in general, but a lot of movies, Failing that, but you think of comic book movies, and you're right, an adaptation of something mm-hmm. that is a is about as perfect as you g- can get to really encapsulate not just like Nolan's vision, but mm-hmm. Batman in his essence. Like you, you have yeah, a lot of that, like not necessarily um Burton ish, but that sort of darkness, greediness right. that Burton right. really brought into mm-hmm. it. You got a lot of stuff we saw in the comics, especially like when I was really into Batman, like in the early 90s with Nightfall and Bane and all of yeah, that. Sure. Like you got that darkness, that bleakness. You Correct. got that in Nolan's movies. You didn't get that yeah. in in Burton's movies. Right and no, obviously, no, no, no. the movies that came after that, there was nothing bleak about those with, with, with sure. Schumacher uh, directing. Sure. But yeah, <laughs> that's true. The, the yeah. Dark Knight, yeah, is probably yeah, one of the best depictions of batman you can i still have to watch the batman some i just haven't gotten a chance to watch okay. it i've heard it's pretty good okay um yeah. i know it's more like a year one sort of story which is, is great because it's a different take on something what we've seen already well batman begins is kind of year one but still right um, right <laughs> well i tell you that 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 movie has the three main components to any good movie which to me is of course good story good acting and the third one which people really sleep on which i don't think they should is the soundtrack i mean oh, yeah. hans zimmer did the soundtrack to all of them and you take the soundtrack out you put in another composer you put in a danny Elfman, who i love by the way but this the, the mood and the story will change and Agreed. so I think those three combinations, like I think of like Gladiator, one of my favorite movies. Again, oh, yeah. great story, great acting, and of course, there's the soundtrack. Godfather, same thing, right? Uh, good acting, great story, amazing soundtrack. So I think a lot of times people sleep on that. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's a great movie, great movie. I would agree, I, and I'm glad you brought it up because they're, the music, the soundtrack just really... That can, that makes a movie perfect. It really does. Uh, it really sets the mood, the tone. It really music is such an underrated when we talk about movies. It's so underrated in how it really elic- elicits our emotions in a scene, sure. and how that Absolutely. music the music that's chosen really can like make or break the scene. Like for instance, I've only seen this movie once, but there are very few movies I've cried at. Wow. And I remember mm-hmm. watching The Notebook. Okay. And <laughs> uh-huh. I remember like the, the scene because it was just so touching. I think also because sure. I had some personal connection with like when the two mm-hmm. characters passed and like one of them suffering all time is that I think that wasn't too long since I had okay. lost some 
some elderly relatives at all times. So I, I kind of kind of felt yeah, some of that. Sure. But the music that went along with that, like Sports. it's so played into the Correct. emotion of Correct. the scene and even the movie in general. Like you couldn't help but but feel it. Um, Correct. Again, if you're an adult, you have an understanding. I think you know a younger <laughs> me would have that would have been totally lost on. But okay, as a, as a grown up, you Correct. know, in my I wasn't quite. 30 yet but i was like mm -hmm. in my late 20s and you know i've been yeah. in love i yeah, lost sure, sure. like i like you have a better understanding of of why that is an emotional scene and it would just it just played it up very well and like i i shed some tears because it was a sad sure. moment in that yep and and, and what that helped with that yeah <laughs> yeah and great movies really not saying no books a, a great movie um right but right. Great movies do that. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying, like, I right, watched no, it once. It was good for what it right. was. <laughs> but it tugged that emotion, though. It tugged that it, emotion. It did. It, it got right? it. it. It did what it was supposed to do. And I understand why so many people love it. Even going, like, another love song, Titanic. Yes. Titanic's yes. music is <laughs> iconic. Of course. Without that music, Titanic would not be Titanic. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Yep. And, 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 and really, back to my story, I think that's the reason why I wanted to include music. And you don't see it in the first five pages, but you'll see right. it in the story of how hip hop music is, you know, so he's badly damaged, but mm -hmm. how these elements, these good things in life, uh, hip hop music in particular, will help to heal him. And that's where he'll eventually he'll get his exactly. powers from and everything. So he, for example, he lands, he said, uh, bare, uh, his hearing is like only 30%. His mm -hmm. eyesight's only like 40%. But these good elements that he's going to find along the way, hip hop, for example, and I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler alert, uh, when he hears it and sees it in the next scenes, it will mm -hmm. actually start healing it. So again, it's about programming, right? And how this programming, in a sense, can heal us. It could fill voids that we may have in life, you know? Okay. Thank you for bringing that back, because I was actually yeah. going to bring, because even before you mentioned that, like yeah. I saw it says Bronx 1982, I'm like, yeah. okay, hip hop. So. Right how big of an impact has hip-hop had in your life wow that's a great question you know i, I tell you eldon you know I, i've been really privileged to live under a lot of musical revolutions we'll call it you know mm -hmm. and hip-hop is certainly one of them i remember what it was like when i heard my first hip-hop song i saw how it really uh transformed the world and if you look at it now i mean forget about it billion dollar industry influences right. everything um and so forth. So yeah, uh, hip hop has a really big influence on me, and especially the graffiti, as I mentioned before, it, it showed me things that I never saw before. And that is the catalyst to creation, as far as I'm concerned. You know, when you see something, you experience something that you never experienced before. Now you have to relate it in your own, on your own terms. And that's right. when I started producing art and graffiti. And certainly, I, I would be nothing without that influence. Because later on in my career, you know, I, I started. I'm working in the graphical arts field and certainly it, it made me, you know, uh, you know, I make my living off it and I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for art, which came from graffiti, which also came from the influence of music. So yeah, hip hop had a really big influence on all of that and all of that. And I wanted to connect that with the story. Um, you know, all of us have tough lives and all of us in particular at that time, right. Mm -hmm. Um, where, you know, uh, things, uh, for certain communities weren't going as well as they should have. And so they needed things. So uh, if the subway pulled in front of them, that was their art gallery. And it was right. beautiful. Um, if if there was a block party going on, uh, they heard that music. That was their concerts, you know. And right. they heard this fresh new music that, again, ends up taking over the world eventually a couple of decades le later. So, yes, super big influence on the story and super big influence on me. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more. Um, um, I imagine i love hip-hop i am um, it's interesting because as a as a kid growing up in the 80s like it was michael jackson right. <laughs> and then it was hip-hop <laughs> and I, i've really gotten to hip-hop more so i would say ele later elementary school it okay was probably, you remember the first hip-hop song what was the first jam that you heard what was the oh man um the first i mean definitely um like sugar hill rapper. gang yeah, rappers are like all, you know, all of that probably first one though. But what, like I, it's weird. Like MC Hammer is hip hop, but I wouldn't say like, oh, that's what I would consider hip hop. Simply because I think I love MC Hammer's 
cross genre appeal. So I Correct. really place him in that, even though he is rap and hip hop. Correct. I'm thinking of like what I consider a hip hop, hip hop. Like I was like a um, raw bass. It takes you a lot of dance stuff. But what got me really, when I was, and also Run DMC. Get, you can't not love Run DMC, especially growing up in the 80s. But this one of the songs that really got me um, was Boogie Down Productions, Love's Gonna Get You. Of course, like, yeah. The grittiness <laughs> of that. Yes. With Kara going spitting it and just oh the God. ability to yeah. tell that story. Um, mm -hmm. and then tribe, and then after that is like like Nas is like my top MC yeah. ever. Yeah, like, of course. And the fact too. that he's still spitting out what he's spitting out is is amazing. Me too. Yeah. Love's gonna get you. That has a big influence on me too. What a story it told, right? Yeah, I think it's a good thing to show your kids if you really want to see the power of hip hop and rap listen to this because why the beat is, is is captivating and the story that krs1 tells is just so profound especially the way it ends right and uh, yeah in terms yeah. of in terms of the lyrics so yeah. and that was when we used that video jukebox so like at the time what like 90 89 i used to go to middle school across town so at the sixth grade i went to my friend's house and his dad took us like to the subway station or what have you and so I'd be sitting there while he and his little brother and whatnot getting ready for school, just be watching video jukebox. Right, yeah, of course, Ralph McDaniels, and, right? Ralph McDaniels. Yeah, exactly. So you you, huh? you see all these things and, and yeah, but Love is going to get you BDP. Just th that whole late 80s, early 90s hip hop, the, the self-conscious aspect of it. You know, yeah. self-destruction always rings out in my head. The The... Yeah political commentary public enemy fight the power I, I don't think you you can't escape that when you talk about hip-hop and even how it evolved uh you know just in the, the mid-90s biggie dmx i mean that like all of that was a soundtrack for my life like yeah. literally from middle school right. to college to an, an adult um now with, with raising young ones that's all they want to listen to now right, is, like like no, bring play. Yeah. Oh, that's from the '80s. Oh, that's from the '90s. Like, like, right. they, like they had that ear, and I'm like, I'm doing something good as a father. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's fascinating where it came from. Again, yeah. it came from the Bronx. It came from South Bronx. It came from block parties, and the comment touches on that. And and, and to know of how it evolved and where it is today, it's it's it influenced everything. You know, you, you don't see any commercials without a a downbeat no. from hip hop. You know, you, you, fashion. Uh, Art, yeah, I mean, I can go on and on. So other genres like, of music, I mean, country sounded more correct. like hip hop. Now. That's it. You know, pop music sounds. I mean, heck, the biggest pop artists, some of the biggest pop artists ever, really got their influence, like in sync and all of them, from hip hop and R and B back in the day. Of course, yeah. and, and what a privilege to live through that. I lived yeah. through the transition. You know, I had three older brothers, and they they were big time into disco. They're older than me, so they lived through the disco phase. And and but what a treat to see the parties, and because they'd had parties when my parents were in there, you know, and they'd have disco parties and everything. But then when I heard my heard my first rap it was Rapper's Delight, and saying, "Wow, what is this? This is right. new." And, and no, again, that decades later took the influence of it. It's it's something something else. Again, a privilege to live through that. Yeah, I don't take that I for agree. granted. No, I I agree in so many respects to see it's see how it's changed, see how it's grown for better and for worse, but more so the, not just the global influence and impact that has had, you know, you, you never think growing up in the eighties and nineties, particularly the eighties when, you know, we really saw it mm -hmm. formulate, people start to get famous. We see run DMC, we be beach street. We see, yeah, we, yeah. we're able to watch all those movies. We, could have never thought that hip hop would be such a universal language across the world. And it's really yeah. amazing. Now, I lived in the suburbs. So, you know, Eldon, I caught some backlash of being like one of the first to listen to hip hop. I remember that going to like middle school and listen. How could you listen to that music? It's not even music. They're, they're not even singing. That was it. Or if they use samples, they're not even playing instruments, you know? It's right. Like, I remember I had to put up the good fight for, you know, listening to hip hop, but boy, you know, I think I had the last laugh because I'm very sure all of those that felt that way, I'm sure their kids are killing some hip hop. Right now. I'm sure they <laughs> love right. this Eminem and whatever the case may be, you know, so. Right. Yeah, so a lot of my identity certainly comes from that, yeah. yeah. So Eddie, tell us when is your Kickstarter dropping? So Kickstarter hopefully will drop the 23rd, between the 23rd and 27th. And I say hopefully because I'm having some issues now getting my preview page up. There's some uh, okay. 
some wonky things that I heard that a Mac user can't open up a campaign. So actually, I was hoping that it'd be started by the time we did this interview, but it's not. So it looks as though maybe this Saturday it will. So what I'm doing is uh, I'm telling everyone to go to my website, uh, www.endofz.com, and there they could sign up for it. Uh, and they could also get the first five pages of the comic also to see what they okay. think. So in the meantime, it should be up soon. And then, but I'm really hoping it drops you know, right after Comic Con, New York Comic Con, it's probably when it, it'll drop and it won't end till till November. Okay, yeah. cool yep. beans. So, tell everybody else what other link would you want them to find you at? Yeah, so endofz.com, that's certainly one. You can follow me on Instagram, uh, same thing, endofz. Uh, you can follow my my graffiti one, ZNK238. Uh, and then you, you'll see me on TikTok and stuff, but it's basically stuff that I've already done on Instagram and things like that. So, Got you. All right, well, Eddie, thank you very much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. You guys, make sure you, you follow Eddie, you keep up with that Kickstarter, because let me tell you, End of Z looks really amazing. And I'm looking forward to seeing more. But you guys, you know where your web style of man works fragrance. Make sure you stay tuned for more. Thank you for your listening ear. Thank you for your time. And remember, be safe out there and be blessed. Your lovely Misty Stone, and you are watching Webster Style with me. What anime are you going to be watching? Well, I'm re-watching.